I don't recommend it. I don't think it is wholesome. I don't think it teaches anything. I don't think kids will get anything out of it. I don't even think that were I a kid, I would have enjoyed it. It doesn't have anything that could, uh, it doesn't, it, it has no value. I don't think it's a good film. I think it's not something anyone should watch. Hello V, hello everyone else, and welcome to Gaping Chasm. I have a subscription to Disney Plus and I don't use it as much as I should, even though there is quite a bit of decent content on there. Uh, not even talking about the originals, but like Disney's backlog is fantastic to have access to. But I thought I should sit down and actually try to watch the original movies before there were too many to actually keep track of. There are six Disney Plus original movies and I sat down and watched all them in the space of about two weeks. I didn't have high hopes for any of them because it's not like people have been like talking about the Disney movies when they talk about Disney Plus right now. They've been talking about like the Mandalorian. Yeah, I, I thought I would sit down, watch them, and let you guys know what I think and if they're good and if you should watch them and whatnot. So first off is One Day at Disney, which is a documentary. I did when I was actually writing up my notes for this video. I realized there were actually quite a few other documentary type videos on Disney Plus that were original to it, but they're all nature documentaries and I didn't want to watch them. So this video is a little bit of a lie. But I did watch this documentary and it is so very middle of the road. It's good background noise. It's interesting i guess for someone like me who's a pretty big fan of the company i i was just like yeah this is this is fun it's good background noise not boring but not exciting it also works a lot like disney propaganda because they chose some of the most dedicated employees and they were like do a 10 minute interview about how wonderful disney was and well that's good and fun there's something just like really skeevy about that i don't know i enjoyed it like i said nothing special it is really cool that they were able to really showcase different corners of the disney empire from stage production to behind the scenes work at the parks to working on animated shows and movies to even the book publishing aspect, which I love. So in that way, it's very cool, but it definitely doesn't go too in-depth on any of those segments for it to be truly interesting. I'm also fairly certain that it was meant to air in segments, and I think there is a way to watch it segmented on Disney+. Plus. So that seems like it'd be more enjoyable, uh, because it doesn't mesh except to be like, oh, and this person works for this part of Disney. Oh, and in a different part of the world, at a different part of Disney, this person also works for Disney. Like, it, there's just, like, no connective tissue there. They didn't really try. Regarding the Disney propaganda thing, there's definitely, like, a, an aspect or a, a mood or a vibe to it that really reminded me of something you might actually see at a Disney park or uh, as part of a commercial for Disney real estate. The fact that it's so bland and, like, has this cheery music in the background the entire time just made it very commercial feeling. Okay, now into the actual fiction, fantasy, family-friendly movies. One thing I wanna say for all of them, every single one has CGI animals at some point during the film, and that's ridiculous. <laughs> Can we just say, that is ridiculous. But part of these reviews are gonna be me reviewing the CGI animals, how they were, if they were good, if they were, needed if they worked or if they were uncanny. First up, Lady and the Tramp. Another one of Disney's live action remakes that they were like, hey, what's a classic movie everybody loved? And they took it and yeah. The only difference between this and the other live action remake so far is that it didn't make it to the theater. They knew right away this was not going to sell any tickets and so they put it onto streaming services. I didn't see Lion King, but from what I've heard, Lion King live action is like shot for shot the original. That is what Lady and the Tramp is. There are such minimal differences that it it's the same movie, just with different special effects. The differences include the dog catcher having slightly more of a role just because they wanted a much clearer villain and a much clearer message through the story, which is that you should adopt dogs, which is a great message, I agree. We get to see the humans' faces a lot more, which is fine, I guess. Uh, the, in general, human characters have more of a role going on. They don't overpower the story, but you do get more of a personality from them. That's nice, I guess. It wasn't really necessary. Tramp is no longer a ladies' man. He is a loner and an I don't need nobody else kind of character. I, 
from what I, I was trying to figure out why they made this change, I, from what I have discovered, it's just that they thought him being a ladies' man was not family friendly. But I don't think in the original film it's like egregious. Like he's not crazy. I like you know. I don't know. Jock is a female dog now, which is fine. Apparently, according to the IMDb trivia, it's still played by a male dog, which is funny. But it, whatever. A change, I guess. I think Disney was at that point just reaching to change anything. They were like, what can we change? How do we make it more family friendly? Yeah, none of these things really impact the story. I will say, and this is the most positive change and I think a good decision and I don't know if it warranted making a whole new mo new movie but uh, they did they changed the cat scene so it's no longer racist which is awesome and I fully support that's a good change otherwise all the other changes were just like you just really wanted to pump this one out you have a checklist and you're like okay Lady and the Tramp just remake it. I do like the story of Lady and the Tramp. I love the original and I love the sequel, Scamp's Adventure. One of my favorites. But I, I mean, this movie, again, it, it brought nothing to the story. It doesn't have the charm of the original because the original is charming because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty original story. It's a good story. You haven't seen it a million times. And even looking back at it, it is still really good and it's beautiful art. The pacing of the original too is just it's slow, but it's not plotting, but it takes its time and it really lets you feel like you're, you know, playing and running. Like as a kid, I would pretend I was one of the dogs in the movie because it was a lot of fun. This movie does not inspire that same amount of fun or charm. It's just lifeless. The acting is fine, uh, and that's really all I have to say. It's one of those films where I knew who the cast of characters were for the animals and even though they did seem like they were trying to put on a character in their voice the whole time I was like, oh yeah, that's Tessa Thompson as Lady, you know. So it's fine. It's just fine. And the CGI is also just fine. They did use real dogs for a large part of the film and it kind of has the same feeling that the older dog adventure movies like Homeward Bound kind of have. So that's kind of nice. I wish it had been unintentionally and not just because they didn't have another way to do it but yeah it, it's just fine nothing stunning nothing I would want to watch again nothing I would recommend unless you just kind of need again background noise or you want to check something off it exists and it probably shouldn't because it feels a lot like a waste of money all right Noel I love Christmas movies so much I will watch Christmas movies any time of the year. They're, they're just so pleasing to me. Like last year, one of my favorite films was Klaus, and that wasn't because it was a Christmas movie, but that definitely added to it. So I, I was really excited for Noel when I saw the trailer for Disney Plus, and they included all this, uh, like all the footage of Noel. But and I, I probably should have watched it around Christmas time, but I did not. I waited till now, and it's 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 good. It's a pretty it's a pretty solid one watch Christmas film. I mean, maybe I'll watch it again. I don't think so. There's nothing that special about it, but I'll get to that in a minute. Noel is about Noel. <laughs> so the Kringle family has been the family of Santa's uh, since you know Santa started. Santa is a title that is passed down to the eldest male child of each of the Kringle line. Noel and her brother's father was Santa, and now that their father has passed away, her brother is going to be Santa. The problem is he does not want to be Santa. He hates it, he's bad at it, and he just, it doesn't fit. Uh, so Noel, his sister, recommends that he go take a long weekend, maybe figure stuff out, get a break, and then he never comes back. He sends the sleigh back and the reindeers back, and he stays where he is. And everyone blames Noel for it. Like she admits, she's like, I told him to take a break, but he's not coming back. And the like whole city turns on her because without Santa, there is you know no commerce, no economy, <laughs> a lot of issues. Children won't get toys. Holidays ruined. Centuries of tradition are gone. Like she did, she messed up, and it is kind of her fault. Although her brother probably shouldn't have thrown her under the bus like that. So Noel sets out with her nanny slash maid, <laughs> an elf. Uh, elf Polly, played by Shirley MacLaine, and it was fantastic. She was great in the role. So they set out to go find and rescue Noel's brother, because it is actually brought up that he could be hurt, he could be in danger. And that's kind of the majority of the movie, is Noel looking for her brother, uh, trying to convince him to come back and be Santa. 
Meanwhile, back home, their cousin Gabe, played by Billy Eichner, is taking on the role of Santa. And I just gotta say, the trio of Anna Kendrick, Bill Hader, and Billy Eichner is like a dream team. I was, I spent a lot of the movie laughing. I thought it was funny. It wasn't like uh, amazingly so. Like it wasn't like I was constantly laughing, but the jokes all landed. I thought it was really enjoyable in that way. One thing I really liked is that Noelle is depicted as a really spoiled character, but she's not mean. She's just super privileged and she doesn't really realize what it means to be privileged or that maybe it is toxic to have that much privilege. And a lot of her journey is her learning that there are a lot of people out there who you don't get gifts on Christmas. And it is not a message that's gone into too deeply in the film. It's very surface level, very shallow, but it is heartfelt and I do think it is a good message. So it's like a fish out of water story and I realized about halfway through that it was trying to be elf. It's trying to, if not be elf, fit into the same world that elf fills. And that kind of sat wrong with me because elf is one of my favorite movies and Noelle, Noelle doesn't really stack up. It's cute, it has similar ideas, but um, it didn't do it as good as Elf, and it's kind of shameful that Disney tried to recreate that magic. A couple other bullet points. The CGI animal is a reindeer, so it's not like too well done, but it doesn't have to be. It's cute, it's charming, and it is not overused, which is always my biggest concern going into kids' films, is that the CGI animal companion is going to be literally plastered on everything, and this was not the case with Snowflake. He was there for like, I don't know, not long, and he's pretty cute, and while the movie probably would be fine without him, it it has that, it, it's got a little bit of charm having him in there. In the film, there is not really a huge romance subplot. There is a character that like, I guess you could be like, oh yeah, Noelle and the detective. But I mean, his story is really focused around his kid and her story regarding him is also kind of focused around his kid, but mostly focused on her learning that not everyone has like a perfect family life or a regular Christmas. Also for a Christmas movie, they acknowledge other faiths and it's very much like, hey cool, good for you, you're Buddhist, that's awesome. Uh, or you're Jewish, that's awesome. Like it was very nice to just like see that in there and it was actually kind of funny. Um, like at one point she greets him and she's like, hey, Merry Christmas. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm Buddhist, but yeah, Merry Christmas, dude. You know, like it's cute, it's nice, it's fun. But this movie, and I'm going to use this word a lot to describe the next film that I talk about, but this movie is just kind of sanitized. It's surface level messaging and like, again, it's fun. It's a good Christmas movie. I would recommend it. Uh, it's good for the family. I don't think anyone would be hurt by it. I don't think that you'll walk away and regret having watched it. Like whereas the other films that I've talked about today I put on in the background, this one I did not. I actually watched it and I had a good time watching it. Now we have to talk about Stargirl. I hated it. It is without a doubt the worst Disney Plus original movie and while that it's not stacking up against that many. I have a, I've, it's one of, it's one of the worst movies I've seen in the last like five years probably. I, I have so many gripes with it. So very many. And when I was writing out my notes slash script for this, I had to like stop myself from just being completely nitpicky because I feel like I wasn't that nitpicky with all the other films but this one had so much going wrong with it that I just wanted to keep finding more. So we're gonna focus on the big things that I have problems with. So what is Stargirl? Stargirl is actually based on a really well-loved and famous novel by Jerry Spinelli. I don't know if it's still big today, but I remember when I was in like, I wanna say elementary and middle school, I was seeing it toted everywhere and I think it was winning awards and stuff. And it is supposed to be really good. And this movie doesn't make me wanna read it. <laughs> like it does the opposite. I do believe, even without having read the book, that the book probably is better because this movie is really bad um, and it would not be hard to be better. Before I even continue with the description, I do want to point out it is called Stargirl, but the narrator and the focal point of view character is Leo. I kind of hate when movies are named after women or about female characters. Like, it's like, oh, Stargirl, but it's told from the point of view from a dude that feels a lot like you're stealing power from the female characters when you do that. That's just a problem I have with films, a very nitpicky. I don't think every film that does this is like bad, but this one didn't manage to make it good. Like it, it's just a trope I don't like. It's a movie claim, 
proclaiming itself to be about Stargirl. And it's really about Leo, but also not really, because it's not really about much, but the plot. Stargirl is new to town, and Leo, our narrator, makes a big point uh, at the very beginning, letting us know that when he was the new kid in town, he was bullied and he was considered a freak because he liked wearing ties to school. Stargirl is very much the antithesis of what is normal at this small town high school. She stands out, she plays ukulele, she's very nice to everyone, she's super colorful, and she's, yeah, new, which I get. I do think that that is definitely something that when you're not the norm for the setting you're in, you're going to stand out. And Leo is immediately captivated by her and worried for her because he thinks she's going to get bullied. Basically, Stargirl ends up becoming really beloved by the school. She starts being considered as the school's good luck charm because the football team, which had like never won a game in like 20 years or something, suddenly starts winning now that she's out there playing her ukulele at halftime. And Grace Vanderwall, who, oh I man, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, she plays Stargirl. She's actually really fantastic. Her music is in general amazing. I recommend her. I think she's a great musician. But even in the role of Stargirl, she really shone. She was the VIP MVP of this movie, and this movie did not deserve her because she is outacting literally everyone in this film. But like I said, she is considered this school hero, a good luck charm. People really rally around her. And then she becomes a social outcast because of something that I'm going to get into. I mean, Leo starts dating Stargirl at the height of her popularity when she becomes an outcast. He ends up dumping her. It's like really depressing. I, their whole relationship isn't really built up. It's supposed to be quirky. It, th th this, this film, this film is Disney's completely sanitized, completely boring, version of what a Manic Pixie Dream Girl is. It's so bad. Oh my god. But one of the football games, basically the player on the opposing team is hurt and Stargirl goes out into the field to go see him and she ends up going with him to the hospital as he's taken away in the ambulance. And this is what turns the school against her. They start seeing her as an outcast and in response they're like why not be just normal like I don't know that feels like a really stupid reason to see someone as an outcast I mean the football team loses and they're like oh we lost because Stargirl wasn't there like no you didn't are you really all irrational that the entire school would turn on this one person because they like legitimately thought she was a good luck charm or something it, it makes no sense no sense not even for a high school movie but so the, the whole school turns on her and they're like why can't you be normal and leo's like why can't you be normal so she decides to start acting normal and regular and she figured like pretty quickly the message is the message of the film was clearly like why be normal when you can be yourself you know and that's a great message i guess it's super overdone these days it's not like anything breathtaking or new it's just like Yep, seen that, read that, heard that, literally what most people believe these days, I think. I don't think it's groundbreaking at all. I mean, again, that might be my perspective, my experience, but I, that seems to be the core of a lot of children's movies and children's stories. And probably when the book originally came out, it was not part of this oversaturated message at the time, but whatever. So Stargirl is like, no, I'm Stargirl, and her and Leo break up, and then they see each other at prom, and then they sing a song together, and then it's over. She leaves, goes on the road with her mom, and the film, which I guess good for her. She got out of a toxic situation, but storytelling-wise, there really wasn't any closure for anyone, not even Stargirl, and definitely not Leo, who is our protagonist. Let's go back to the acting. I said Grace Vanderwall is fantastic, and she is. She really does outact everyone. Karan, Karen, I'm sorry, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but Karen Brar, who plays Kevin, who's Leo's friend, also is actually doing a really good job. He's super underused. Pretty much every side character is underused. He's the only one that gets like any personality, any characteristics, but like literally every other one of Leo's friends gets nothing. I I'm not gonna say like anyone was like directly bad, they were all just really flat, except Giancarlo Esposito, whom I normally love and really like his acting and all the roles he's played, but he is really bad in this. Um, I don't really know what he was going for. I think it was eccentric. He ends up coming off as just someone who t making their lines up as they go, and maybe he was, um, but it, uh, I hate it. I, I, 
literally anytime he was on screen, I was like, oh god. Because his character was so, I mean, ugh. Necessary character for the plot, because he's like the wise one, but he was, it was not, it was not good. And because all the characters are so one-dimensional, mine is like Stargirl and Leo who are like one and a half dimensions. The relationships between characters are really thin and rickety and just really forced. We don't really see, we're just told about things. And the scenes where we're supposed to be seeing, such as the interactions between Leo and his mother, there's no chemistry on screen. You, you have no attachment, you don't see attachment between the characters. You just see two actors, you know, saying their lines. Like, they, they were a worse family unit than a lot of the family units you see in commercials. <laughs> I didn't believe for one second that they were in any way, shape, or form playing mother and son, except that the movie kept telling me and reinforcing it with like, oh, this is what a mother must do, you know, I, ugh. But here is my biggest problem with the film and something that actually makes me really upset. And I'm upset because they didn't take this and make it a message or really say anything about it. They just threw it in there as a plot point and it's kind of thrown out. So Stargirl, so there's a like school gossip show, I guess, where they have like different students come on and do interviews and Stargirl uh, agrees to do it after everything happens at the football game and the school kind of denounces her. She goes on to tell her side and it's like, it's a really good defense. She's like, yeah, the kid didn't want to let go of my hand. He was really afraid. I couldn't let him go to the hospital alone. The school does not understand that. They're like, wow, you seem like you really wanted our team to lose. Like, it's so stupid. This is one of the scenes where some of the bullying does come through. Obviously, the whole school is turned against her, so that's bullying. But there is a character who does step forward, and she has a very legitimate gripe with Stargirl. And I wish that that had been explored more. It was kind of one of those good intentions pave the path to hell kind of things where it's like yeah she did it out of like star girl did this thing out of kindness but she didn't actually think through her her decision the consequences of it and i think that's something that's important and i think that if that had been a message like a really they could have told this story in a really healthy way and told like that thread in a really healthy way because that's something that i think high schoolers really are still grappling with is consequence especially of good actions maybe having bad consequence and you do have to face that sometimes but I mean, that's thrown out. That's not what I have a problem with. At this tea show or whatever, at the gossip show, they ask her what her real name is. And she's like, my name is Store Girl. And they're like, no, your real name, the name you were born with. And she's like, my name is Star Girl. And then they're like, no, it's not. And anyway, it comes out that her birth name is Susan. <sighs> Which like, and then there is like no respect moving forward. Like it is after this point that Stargirl starts dressing very casually and normally and kind of loses that spark of outgoing creativeness. And she starts going by the name Susan and people start calling her Susan and Leo starts calling her Susan and he even tells her that he loves Susan. And I was really uncomfortable watching it because she affirms multiple times that her name is Stargirl and the school is just like nah and starts using her dead name and bullying her into having to use it and I hated it so much it was uncomfortable but the film doesn't depict it as being uncomfortable so much as just being wrong uh, like just the wrong signifier uh, the film also really depicts it as like Susan is this normal boring person and Stargirl is the ukulele playing colorful one but like her name is Stargirl even when she's dressing down and not playing ukulele she she starts going back to Stargirl not long after all this happens but the movie really just dismisses this major act of just aggression from everyone around her super distrustful and i'm glad she dropped leo because pff, what a jerk but i just it was so frustrating to watch and for the movie to not put as much weight on how harmful that is like i feel like 
again that's a thread that had they 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 taken it and run with it and told it respectfully and actually told it impactfully it would have been a really great message like a really complicated really great message about people's names and how important a name is and if someone tells you their name is star girl their name is star girl not susan so that's my biggest problem with the film okay okay nitpicky stuff i said i'm not gonna go super nitpicky but i do want to talk about things that just kind of added salt to the wound of this whole name thing so <laughs> this is just like really weird cinematography and direct directing I get I was like why is this happening but there's a scene early on where Leo is sitting at a table like the the dining room table the dining table it is kind of dark in the room and he's doing his homework and his mom is like sitting across from him eating her dinner and like watching him do his homework and it was just really odd and she would like comment, I think she even commented about like, why aren't you eating? And I was like, he's doing his homework in a dark room and you're staring him down. Like, this is weird. Do either of you find this comfortable? Is this something that happens in like people's houses? I, I personally couldn't do like homework if there were other people really around that weren't doing homework. And it's even more distracting if someone's eating. Also like eating dinner. She's like, don't you want dinner? And he's like, I'm doing, like he doesn't say he's doing homework, but he's clearly doing homework. So there's a CGI animal on this, like every other film and it's a rat. I don't know why they needed the CGI rat. It's really clearly fake. It like runs up Stargirl's back and runs under a car. And I don't think they needed it to run up her back. And I think they could have gotten a real rat to run under a car. Also, it literally, like, the rat literally has nothing to do with the plot except to make her seem more unique. So this is a really like personal trope that I hate. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I really hate this trope. I've seen it in a lot of coming of age and learning type Bildungsroman type movies. And I don't think it's inherently a bad trope. I just hate it. When the really outgoing, loud, quirky character kind of influences and peer pressures the introverted, quiet character to be loud and extroverted because that's like the only way to make your voice heard. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it's really integral to the character that they, they literally aren't heard at all. They don't know how to get their voice out there. Um, like Perks of Being a Wallflower, it, there's not like an egregious amount of other characters being like, well you have to do this, that's how you make your mark on the world, but there's a lot of characters encouraging uh, to come out of the shell. And I think that is important and I think that is a good story and a good thing to share and help because yeah, you, you shouldn't let yourself be locked up inside. Um, but you, there's a lot of different ways to express yourself and it, it, it doesn't have to be shouting. It doesn't have to be by being the loud, quirky, colorful one. That's just one way of expression. And it's not that Stargirl is trying to get Leo to be her or to be all those things, but there are a couple scenes where she's just like, do this because that's, that's how you can prove that you're not in your shell. And Leo, like he's the narrator, like he literally has a voice over and we see everything so clearly through his point of view, view and through his voice that I, I never had any trouble believing that he didn't, like the movie presents him as a character who has found his niche and it's a comfortable place and he's happy and it's healthy and I don't like, I just don't like that there's characters coming in telling him how to behave because that's a better way to do it. Like me as someone who is an introvert and who's not super loud, not super colorful, not super quirky, not someone who is gonna go do wild and crazy things all the time. I, I'm just not always comfortable doing that. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. And I don't like when the comfort of like an introverted quiet character is disregarded as being, uh, or is, is seen as being a negative thing. Cause I don't think it always is. But that's not just a problem with this film. It was a problem with a lot of teenage films, but yeah. There is a, pr probably a lot more I could say about this film. Those are all the big nitpicks and I'm not gonna go deeper, but it, God, I don't recommend it. I don't think it is wholesome. I don't think it teaches anything. I don't think kids will get anything out of it. I don't even think that were I a kid, I would have enjoyed it. It doesn't have anything that could, uh, it doesn't, it, it has no value. I don't think it's a good film. I think it's not something anyone should watch. But speaking of good films, finally get to talk about the two films that I watched that I absolutely loved and 
strongly recommend. First of all, Togo. Uh, going into it, I was like, oh, cool, another Call of the Wild type movie where an old man goes on an adventure with his dog in the wilderness. And yeah, that is this movie, but this movie is also so much more, and I loved it. Um, by the end, I was like, I couldn't stop raving about how much I loved it and how good it is. I am going to try not to spoil too much, but things are going to be spoiled. So if you don't want to know how it ends, <laughs> or if you don't want to know like a piece of the ending, skip to this timestamp. But if you don't care, and I don't think knowing this fact is going to change your enjoyment of the film, I just keep watching. It, it's The thing is, Togo is based off a true story. And it's a story that you've actually probably heard just incorrectly, because we find out at pretty much at the very end of the film that the dog that gets the credit for the story is Balto. And if you were a 90s kid, you probably watched the animated Balto movie. Like, I, I loved Balto. I loved Balto. I think there were like spin-offs and sequels and I loved all of them. It's a lie. Balto was a dog involved. He ran like the last leg of this uh, journey, but Togo did most of the work and he did all the hard work and Togo is often forgotten. Like Balto is the one with the statue up and the one who was like headlined as like the dog who saved this town, but it, Togo did it. Okay, so if you, you don't know who Balto is, you think I'm crazy. You're like, who is Walter? Why would I know that as well? Okay, basically, uh, I don't know the year, um, but a while ago, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, there was a diphtheria break outbreak in, Ala in remote Alaska, and the only way to get any medicine was to send out a dog team and a human to go a very long distance and get it. Like, it, it was during a horrible storm, and it was something that seemed pretty much impossible. Sepala and his dogs, led by Togo, are the dogs who actually do the majority of it. They actually meet kind of like halfway, someone meets them with the medicine, and then they're able to go most of the way back. They cross some of the most treacherous territory and one of the worst storms, and they were facing a lot of external threats just from the wilderness and it being a very hard, dangerous place. And Togo was a very old dog at the time, I think he was 14, and he managed to survive and do this. They stopped and they were able to hand off the medicine to someone who then would later hand it off to the man who would have Balto and would basically cross the finish line and come up in town with the medicine. There was a newspaper man there waiting for him, takes his picture, and Balto goes on the cover. So that's like this that's like the story. But Togo not only tells the story of Seppala, who is the man who not only owned, trained, and is the one like with the dogs going to get the medicine, but it follows Seppala and Togo uh, in flashbacks and modern current events. So you get to see them making this treacherous journey and you also get to see Togo being raised. And Togo was a super rambunctious pup. He didn't listen and he was trying to always be part of the sled dogs even when he was really little and couldn't be and kind of got on Seppala's nerves and Seppala wanted to get rid of him and actually tried a couple times, all to failure. So through the flashbacks we really see how the bond between the two grew and how Togo became such a reliable creature and how just close they are, which makes the present day stuff even more emotional and hard to get through when you're seeing this dog and this man struggling. And it is in a lot of ways heartbreaking because Togo is old and you know that this is definitely his last run. I'm not gonna spoil it. Uh, it, for those out there who don't like to see the dog die, it's nothing egregious. He has his way happy and quiet. Um, but it, it's still, you know, it's hard in that way. But I, I mean, I, I, this new movie is not made for me. I don't think it's made for anyone, like specifically. I think it's just a movie that was made and put on a streaming platform and that is the most perfect place for it because this would have had no chance in the theater. It's, it's got this beautiful core heartfelt story and I loved that, but I never would have gone out to see it. I'm really glad that I did watch it and I do strongly recommend it to everyone. Uh, the dogs are CGI for part of it, but you can't tell. It's fantastic. They look like real dogs the entire time. So much better than Call of the Wild. But uh, it's just it's just a wonderful story. 
the only thing that really keeps this from being a five star film in my opinion is the dialogue. It is not a dialogue heavy film but whenever the human characters are interacting and talking the dialogue is really stilted and affected. It's very much like they're reciting Shakespeare the entire time for some reason and uh, it just took me out of the story anytime they went to like deep dialogue and I was like mm, um, what's happening? Stop talking. Go do things. But Togo, I loved it. I strongly recommend it. It's amazing. It's one of those amazing dog stories. And Timmy Failure, 100% my favorite film that I got to watch for this experiment. I had kind of high hopes because the trailer looked really good and this movie did not disappoint. I don't want to go too in depth because I really don't want to spoil it. I think everyone should pretty much stop what they're doing and watch it. It is family friendly. It is hilarious. I was laughing constantly. I did not expect to enjoy it like nearly this much. But not only is it funny, but it has a really, really lovely depth to it and a lot of subtlety to the characters. A uh, short story, Timmy Failure is a fifth grader who is a detective or he sees himself as a detective. And the story is actually told with this sort of noir uh, glaze over everything, which is so cool and so well done. Like the acting, you're like, it, 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 it's, it's very noirish, and I'm a big fan of noir, and it works really well in this in this comedy. So he is just very serious about everything, and he's trying to uncover. There's actually a couple different mysteries, but he's trying to basically uncover a plot with the Russians. The movie takes place in Portland, and the film absolutely luxuriates in that. It's beautiful. It is uh, it is filmed on location, and you can definitely tell it totally embraces the city and all its quirkiness and that actually really gives the movie its legs allows it to spread out and be as wonderful and weird as it would like this film actually i think would have done really well in theaters because it has something for everybody and it even has a cgi animal a polar bear who i thought was going to be super annoying but ended up being one of the best parts the polar bear itself obviously doesn't have much of a, it doesn't have a voice doesn't have a character in that way but has a lot of characteristic in the way it moves and interacts with the world and timmy's relationship with the polar bear is both funny and really heartfelt and really wonderful i seriously i, I seriously would not mind owning this film i i think i would I, I would definitely watch it again i'm trying to get more people to watch it because i just think it's fantastic and uh Again, I'm, I'm really trying not to say anything too in depth because seriously, just stop what you're doing. Go watch Kimmy Failure on Disney Plus if you have it. It is by and far their best original film and I hope it gets sequels because I will devour those. All right, that is all for me. That's all I really have to say about the Disney Plus movies. I wanted to jump on these before there were too many to watch. We obviously have Artemis Fowl coming, I think, in a couple months. It was canceled its theatrical run because of COVID-19 and so it was coming straight to the streaming platform and that was a film I was going to go to see anyways because I really liked the books when I was a kid. Uh, but now I have an opportunity to, when I watch that, I'll probably review it here so you guys can see my thoughts on that, see how it stacks up against the other Disney Plus original films. We also have a couple other Disney Plus films coming this year, including the new Phineas and Fur movie, which is probably going to be amazing, and a movie called Magic Camp, which is produced by Gun Studios, the James Gunn, not the gun. And I'm pretty excited for that too because it sounds like it'll be funny. I really think Disney Plus has a lot of potential. I think that there's a lot of good people who could put, who are making movies at Disney and those movies could end up on Disney Plus uh, as originals. But right now, I really only come away thinking two of them are worth rewatching and worth recommending to everybody, which is a little bit of a problem because, I mean, I guess it's not a problem because it's Disney and they have a huge backlog, but for any other streaming platform, that would be a major problem. Especially because Togo and Timmy Failure, I've seen a lot of advertisements for Timmy Failure, or I was back when it was coming out, but since then I haven't seen any push for it uh, or talk about Togo at all. And I think that's a shame. So do not forget to subscribe if you want to see my reviews of Disney Plus originals as they come out. I do plan on staying as up to date on them as I can. And thank you for watching. Goodbye V, goodbye everyone else. I'm gonna go have lunch.